Hello Unity fans, it's time for part 4 of my series of videos in which I'm reviewing and also adding on to Catlike Coding's hex map tutorial. If you haven't seen the previous videos, I'll place links in the description or follow the link at the top right to start at the introduction. At the end of part 3, we're actually in a position where we already have all the features of the map in place. We could happily create complete maps manually. But could we create realistic random maps as a starting point? The types of games using these maps often require random maps to play on lots of times. Could we go further and create completely automated random maps? I think you already suspect the answer. How would we go about doing this? The best way to get a realistic earth type map is to model the real world processes that determine how the earth's geography is formed. Of course, you would never be able to include all or even many of the factors. It would become too complex. There is a trade-off between feasibility, believability and playability and you're looking for a point in between that works for your situation. So today we'll be looking at how to model elevating land, letting erosion occur, a water cycle, rivers, temperature, biomes and finally wrapping the map east to west. The first step is to push some land upwards through the water level to form ridges or mountains. Chunks of land are selected randomly throughout the map and the size of these chunks can be set. For example, chunks of size 20 lead to many small islands while chunks of size 200 give us a few big land masses. If we randomize between smaller and larger values, we get a good spread. However, the chunks all have the same compact shape. We also need to add some irregularity by mixing up the order in which hexes are selected when pushing land up. Maximizing this randomness parameter leads to the most varied land masses. Next, we can let the land be raised extra high to form more mountain ranges and prioritize grassland above sandy areas. But we can also let some hexes sink in, giving us valleys and inland lakes. Increasing the land percentage parameter gives us a lot more land and less sea. We can also raise the sea level. At the lowest level there will be a lot of sandy areas, but at higher levels these are flooded leading to more grassland and mountains. All of this leaves us with a rough starting point for our world, but there's still a lot to be done. Next we cater for a border of sea around the map, selecting the position of the random chunks in such a way that they're unlikely to fall within the border, except for a few cells here and there. The thickness in hexes of the east and west borders can be set separately from that of the north and south borders, and they can be combined to ensure there is sea all around the map if required. We also allow the map to be divided into two, three or four regions with the width of the borders between the regions also customizable. If the border is narrow, it could happen that bridges form between land in different regions. All of these options provide you with many possibilities in terms of land formations. Note that the land is still very ragged with erratic mountain peaks and lots of swapping between types of land from a hex to its neighbor. We next allow for erosion to smooth out the land. Land or soil from high-lying hexes are washed down to low-lying hexes, filling them up. In this way, the land is smoothed out. If we allow complete erosion, we get some very smooth geography. Something less aggressive leads to a better mix between raggedness and smoothness. The next section models the climate, focusing on the most important factor, the water cycle. To visualize the cloud density over our terrain, we adjust the terrain shader slightly to display a black and white shade determined by the cloud density, rather than the actual textures. A toggle is added to the shader so that we can easily switch this on and off. Firstly, clouds are modeled by letting water evaporate from water cells. Looking at the shaded geography, all the land cells are black while the water cells are white. This is because the clouds form above the water cells and they are not yet dispersed by wind. If we let each cell's clouds disperse into its six neighbors, the clouds start spreading. Since each evaporation cycle adds more clouds to the global climate, almost the entire map is filled with clouds, except the places that are very far from water, to which the cloud could not disperse completely. 
To get rid of some clouds, we need to add precipitation. A certain percentage of the water needs to fall back down. If we set this parameter to 25%, we see that the clouds only make it a few hexes inland before they've dissipated. But that water should not disappear from the world. It's just changed its state and position. It makes sense to model moisture in addition to clouds. This moisture now sustains the clouds and lets them move further inland. But rain does not stay in one place after it has fallen. A lot of it flows down to lower land, which we model as runoff. Each hex's moisture level is adjusted by letting some of its water flow to any lower neighboring cells and letting some moisture from any higher neighboring cells flow into it. This causes more varied moisture distribution. We can also model seepage, where some water seeps into neighboring hexes with the same elevation. This does not have a huge impact due to almost the same amount of water flowing between two neighbors in many cases. This is a decent water cycle, but it is unrealistic that moisture basically reduces uniformly the further away from water a hex is situated. In nature, prevailing winds blow clouds into mountain ranges, forcing the clouds upwards, where they can hold decreasing amounts of water. This causes more rain on the wind side of the mountain and drier air to reach the other side, leading to what is known as rain shadows. Implementing a prevailing wind direction and strength causes these rain shadows along higher elevations on our geography as well. The final factor in the water cycle simulation is a starting moisture, which can be tweaked to increase the overall moisture present in the climate system, should wetter climates be required. When the water simulation has been completed, biomes are defined based on the amount of moisture present in the hexes. But there are no rivers yet. To add rivers, the most important factor to determine is where the river should start. We can also set the approximate percentage of river hexes to create. Rivers need water and they need to flow downhill. So we select randomly between hexes that are both high and have a lot of moisture. If we send moisture multiplied by a measure of terrain elevation to the shader, we can see where the prime spots for river origins are, and most rivers indeed originate from these spots. Care is now taken to ensure rivers flow downhill, avoid sharp turns, and merge into one long river when one river runs into the origin of another. Also, rivers keep their distance from other rivers to avoid trying to merge from the side. And there is also a probability of forming a lake on its path or at its endpoint if the geography allows this. Applying all these rules leads to a realistic spread of rivers across the map. Our final climate factor is temperature. We can select minimum and maximum temperature parameters, a temperature jitter that adds some random fluctuations, and we also let elevation impact temperature with higher hexes being colder. If we send the temperature to the shader, we can see how our options affect the temperature across the map. We can select whether we'd like to model a northern or southern hemisphere map, or one with both hemispheres. We can now use this two-factor climate, moisture and temperature, to set our biomes, including plants. We also allow some underwater biomes for variety. All that remains is to allow the map to wrap east to west if required. We accomplish this by adding all chunks to columns and moving columns to the other side of the map as the camera pans around. The hexes to the far east in every row also need to be connected as neighbors to the hexes to the far west, so that the game mechanics treat them as next to each other. The bulk of this section is about visually connecting the seam well seamlessly by making sure all the metrics, noise and distances act as if the map was truly a cylinder. This includes unit movement and visibility, where a unit needs to be suddenly teleported to the other side of the map when moving onto a neighboring hex. Many small details need to be ironed out, but eventually everything works seamlessly. And so we have come to the end of my review of Catlike Coding's hex map tutorial. In the next video, I will go through how I added this spitting selector that can handle a variable number of objects. It also interacts with the terrain height and fades each object in and out according to how close to being selected the object is. Please like and subscribe to stay tuned.